Hi, good evening. Just a super quick welcome from the Leon Levy Center. My name is Thad Zolkowski. I'm the Associate Director of the Leon Levy Center. Um, I think it was four or five years ago you were last here by a, in person. So welcome back. That's mainly my, that's the main thing I wanted to say. I, I love this event. It's a very special event. Um, the moral of which seems to be the rumors of the death of great editors has been, have been greatly exaggerated, which I found quite heartening as an author. Um, but so I'll, I'm going to just say welcome to you all. And um, Linda Level, the president of BIO, will now take over and MC things properly. Thank you very much. I want to thank you all for coming. This is a great occasion, and at least for me, this is the first time I've seen a lot of you in person <laughs> instead of on Zoom, so it's wonderful to see you, and I, I appreciate your coming. Um, this is an event that BIO is very proud of. This is, I'm the president of Biographers International Organization. You can see our logo on the screen. Um, this is an organization, it's barely over 10 years old, um, and it is an organization primarily for writers of biography, but also for readers and editors and other people who appreciate biography. It's a thriving organization. We have an annual conference in May, and we have many other um, activities throughout the year to get for biographers to meet one another and interact with one another and learn about the craft. So this um, event has been going on, I think, for about seven years of our existence. The last two years, we had to do it on Zoom, so it's wonderful to be back in person again. Um, as biographers, we are very appreciative of the work that others do to help our books see the light of day and find audiences. And so um, almost from our beginnings, we have wanted to honor an editor who has been especially um, good at parenting biographies into existence. And so that's why we're here, gathered here together tonight um, to honor Jerry Howard, who has been a wonderful editor of biographers. Um, what, the way the program will unfold, um, we will hear from five of the biographers who have worked with Jerry in the past. Um, two of them will be on video. They could not be in here, here in person um, tonight, and three of them you have here um, before you. And so they will each speak about their um, work with Jerry. And then we will have Heather Clark, who is the... Um, was the chair of the awards committee that selected Jerry this year for the award, and Heather Clark will present the award to Jerry, and then Jerry will have a few words for us as well. So let me introduce to you um, the five biographers, and then Heather will introduce Jerry to you. Um, the first one on the video will be Madison Smart Bell. Um, forgive me for reading this, but he is a professor of English at Goucher College in Baltimore, where he teaches in the creative writing program. He's a former fellow of the Leon Levy Center for Biography, and his most recent book is Child of Light, a biography of Robert Stone. He is the author of 22 books, including three collections of short stories, two biographies, 15 novels, and the fiction writing textbook <laughs> Narrative Design. His novel All Souls Rising was a finalist for the National Book Award. Next to speak is Debbie Applegate. She is the author most recently of Madam, the biography of Polly Adler, icon of the jazz age. Her first book, The Most Famous Man in America, the biography of Henry Ward Beecher, won the 2007 Pulitzer Prize for Biography and was a finalist for the Los Angeles Book Prize and the National Book Critics Circle Award for Biography. She is a graduate of Amherst College and was a Sterling Fellow in American Studies at Yale University where she received her PhD. Next, we have Katherine Harrison. 
Um, she is the author of two biographies, Joan of Arc, A Life Transfigured, and Sainte Therese of Lisieux, and she has written the novels Thicker Than Water, Exposure, Poison, The Binding Chair, The Seal Wife, Envy, and Enchantments. Her autobiographical work includes The Kiss, Seeking Rapture, The Road to Santiago, The Mother Knot, and True Crimes. She has also written a book of true crime while they slept. Jim Kaplan has been, has been writing noted biography, journalism, and fiction for more than four decades. The author of Frank, The Voice, the Voice and Sinatra, The Chairman, the definitive two-volume biography of Frank Sinatra, Kaplan has written more than 100 major profiles of figures ranging from Miles Davis to Meryl Streep, from Arthur Miller to Larry David. His most recent biography is Irving Berlin, New York Genius for Yale's Jewish Lives series. Jay Perini is a poet, novelist, and biographer who teaches at Middlebury College. His mo most recent book is Borges and Me, An Encounter, he has written eight novels, including The Damascus Road, Benjamin's Crossing, The Apprentice Lover, The Passages of H.M., and The Last Station, which was made into an Academy Award-nominated film. His biographical subjects include John Steinbeck, Robert Frost, William Faulkner, and Gore Vidal. His nonfiction works include Jesus, The Human Face of God, why Poetry Matters, and Promised Land, 13 books that changed America. So thank you all for coming to this event. And now Michael will sh we'll start with the videos and then hear from the writers who are present. Thank you. Thanks, Linda. <laughs> um, it's great to see everyone. I'm Michael Gately, the executive director, if we haven't met. I first met Jerry Howard in 1982. McCork Smith, who I submit was the Maxwell Perkins of his generation, had acquired my first novel for Viking. Jerry was a daring young paperback editor then, and he sweetened my deal by taking that first novel for Penguin. In the years that followed, he stuck with me, acquiring my books for the Penguin Contemporary American Fiction series long after Cork and I had both moved on from Viking. We moved on parallel tracks through the next few decades and I saw him evolve into an elder statesman of publishing himself while never losing his adventurous taste in contemporary fiction. Alongside his great work as an editor, he published seminal articles like Mr. Perkins, He Dead, and generally served as a liaison between the writers of our time and the publishing business, which could often seem inimical to them. We remained friends and supported each other in different ways, but I never worked with him editorially until he acquired my biography of Robert Stone for Doubleday. I gave him, not without trepidation, a vastly overwritten draft more than 900 pages long. To his temperate response, I replied, you cut, I'll suture. Few editors at the time would have accepted such a proposition, but Jerry did, and we did the work accordingly. I won't say it was easy street. We fought sometimes, sometimes I won, sometimes he did, and the book was much the better for it. I think it was one of the last, if not the very last book he edited before his retirement, and I believe it's something we can both be proud of at the end of a long day. Jerry, I wish I could be there to clink glasses with you on this occasion, but I'm teaching a fiction workshop tonight. Here's hoping that group includes a couple of the writers of tomorrow. Here's Zoom's second best. Slide and the best of good luck for the future that remains to both of us. Good evening. 
I am deeply disappointed that I cannot be here in person to bestow Bio's Editorial Excellence Award on my longtime editor, Jerry Howard. Frankly, I have been waiting a very long time for this moment. I have been hoping, I dare say expecting him, to receive this award since it was first established in 2014. When I first met Jerry, around the turn of the last century, he already possessed a legendary reputation as an editor of fiction. He was known as a cultural omnivore with good taste, as one of his authors described him. In an era where the literary novel was king, Jerry was renowned for publishing many of the great white postmodernists, to borrow a phrase from one of his colleagues. He began his career in the early 1970s as a newly minted English major from Cornell, and over the next half century, as he moved up the ranks from Harcourt Brace to Viking Penguin to Norton to Doubleday, he shaped the contours of American literature as we know it. By the time I met him, he was known, paradoxically, as both a trailblazing talent spotter and one of the last of that noble old breed, the old-fashioned man of letters. But I knew nothing of all of this when my agent, Susan Rabbiter, introduced me to him when I was pitching the proposal for my first book. Or to be candid, I was re-pitching the proposal for my first book. I was about 30 years old at that time and I had just suffered the well-deserved misfortune of having my original book contract with HarperCollins canceled after I turned in my first few chapters. So now I was searching for a second chance. Susan Rabiner, God bless her, was sure that Jerry would be my knight in shining armor. Trust me, she insisted, he's perfect for this project and he's perfect for you. Why he agreed with that estimation, I still do not know, but Susan was right. He was indeed perfect for me. Now, I've, I've never had another editor, and Jerry is far too discreet to gossip about other authors, uh, unfortunately. But to my mind, he was everything a biographer could want. He is broad-minded, although he is still occasionally able to be shocked. Uh, he is deeply curious and irrepressibly enthusiastic with, with a fine, fine sense of humor. Uh, he is incredibly knowledgeable on a vast array of subjects, as all biographers' editors should be, and he was unfailingly supportive, even when I didn't exactly deserve it. In all of our years together, he never expressed anything other than complete faith in my abilities, even when I did not share his certainty. And if, in fact, maybe he wasn't always so certain himself, he was always too smart and too gentlemanly to let me know. And... Now, this, this is the kicker. Apparently, he had the patience of Job. Now, I'm sure some people would say he was far too patient, especially in my case. Uh, perfect as he was for me, I am certain that I drove him absolutely nuts at many points, especially at the very end. Despite spending 13 years, 13 years on my second book, I kept him on tenterhooks until the very last minute, as I raced to turn in my manuscript before he retired in December of 2020. I beat him to the finish line by only one week. Uh, and I will say it was definitely not as much fun to roll out the book without him by my side. But beyond my personal experiences, Jerry's reputation as an editor of fiction has overshadowed his tremendous contributions to the field of biography. He has always treated biography as high art as worthy of careful craftsmanship and vigorous storytelling as any novel. Even more important, I think, he approaches the biographical enterprise with a historian's eye for the larger landscape. Jerry has played an unsung role as an impresario of historical memory. He has made a career out of resurrecting the once famous but now forgotten influencers of American culture. His Brooklyn-bred passion for American culture in all of its gritty, glittering facets led him to publish biographies on an extraordinary range of subjects. He has shaped our historical cast of characters, the people whom we still remember today, as surely as he has shaped the literary canon of the late 20th century in fiction. 
Jerry is himself an active and affectionate historian of the publishing industry and a walking repository of literary lore that covers most of the 20th century. The internet is littered with dozens of Jerry's nimble, witty, and deeply felt essays on the world of books. I, I know this does not speak well of my character, but sometimes it was a little bit irritating to discover that he had published yet another essay in his spare time while here I was still lumbering along in the library. His insider's insights and critical evaluations have shaped generations of young editors and have provided valuable fodder for future and current historians. Perhaps most impressive to me is that while Jerry is as savvy and as shrewd as they come, not once has he ever seemed cynical to my mind. Even after four decades in the cutthroat marketplace of corporate publishing, he retains an almost pure love of writing and reading. As Jerry himself once wrote, quote, at the primal level where the reader meets text and experiences emotions ranging from boredom and impatience to I love this and I have to have to publish it excitement, I think I am still that young man in the hunt and on the make, always searching for the big wow. The big wow. It has been one of the great privileges of my life to be one of Jerry Howard's edit authors, and it has been an even greater privilege to be his friend. And now, to my delight, I can even call him a colleague. Jerry was once quoted as saying, I am not a failed novelist, in point of fact, I am a failed literary critic. Uh, but I believe, in point of fact, that he is a natural born literary biographer. Or as he once put it, he has always been a sucker for actual facts about actual writers. And here, here is the proof of my theory. After retiring from the editor's chair in 2020, he has officially joined our ranks. He is currently laboring over a biography of the eminent literary critic and editor Malcolm Cowley for Penguin Press. The late Mr. Cowley has no idea how lucky he is. And just to prove that he is truly one of the tribe, it is my understanding that Jerry's manuscript is already two years overdue. Jerry, I truly hope you are as lucky with your editor as I was with mine. Congratulations on this deeply deserved honor, and thank you. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here. I always think of myself as sort of, um, I feel slightly fraudulent under these circumstances because I don't think of myself as a biographer. Um, or if I do, it's more as a sort of accidental biographer. Um, never thought about writing one until, um, oh gosh, a little after, like 2003, Jim Atlas, who was the editor of the Penguin Lives, called me completely out of the blue and said, asked me if I didn't want to write a biography of Therese of Lisieux. Um, and once my agent and my husband and friends who had written for the series all assured me it was a mistake, I said yes, because I'm like that. <laughs> and um, if enough people say no, I feel a yes come over me. So I, um, and two, I had always hated Therese of Lysia above any other saint, so I felt that that was at least an as interesting a point of departure as love. Um, and you know, the money wasn't good, but I was flattered by the company I'd be keeping, the author friends that I checked in with, like Jane Smiley and Patty Bosworth and Mary Gordon. Um, and the part of writing that I always had considered the most troubling and onerous as a fiction writer, the plot, had been entirely taken care of, um, accomplished by my subject, who had lived a short, cloistered, and largely uneventful life. Um, <laughs> what better for an accidental biographer? Uh, <laughs> and anyway, how dangerous of an accident could writing a biography be? Um, in this case, it was a lucky match. Uh, hatred yielded to respect, and then even love. And I thought of it as a kind of a primer or a stitching sampler 
a kind of a simple book that taught me how to write somebody else's life story and uh, in no way prepared me to begin to think about Joan of Arc, about whom literally tens of thousands of books have been written. Um, as I pointed out to Jerry over lunch, and I asked him, why would anyone want another biography of Joan of Arc? And he leaned across the table and said, because you haven't written one. <laughs> Which was an amazing thing to hear. Uh, permission, invitation, maybe a challenge. Um, I don't know, what is it like to have an editor who, having reviewed the competition with you over lunch, Marina Warner, Vita Sackville West, Mark Twain, Bertolt Brecht, George Bernard Shaw, Shakespeare says, in essence, you go, girl. <laughs> it's your turn now. <laughs> um, you know, Jerry's faith was really all I had in the beginning. Um, his faith opened a door and opened me as a writer to the kind of narrative and the kind of work that I didn't know I could do. Um, I think up until I'm working with Jerry, I would have, ex and, and I had written 14 books before Joan of Arc, um, and I would have characterized myself as someone who worked hard to disprove sort of real or perceived editorial doubt um, rather than fulfilling its faith. Um, I don't know how much of that was about me, that it was that sort of I'll show you energy um, that powered me forward. Um, but this was a whole different experience and Jerry had the sort of calm confidence that sort of allowed me to take my eyes off the tightrope for the first time as a writer of biography and look around and just sort of see what I could do. Um, and I mean, not only did I have <laughs> a plot that had been lived by somebody else, I had a plot that had been written by 10,000, tens of thousands of other people. So I had a very, I had a biography on my hands, but I had something bigger and different on my hands too. Um, I, had, I had something sort of almost meta, like the story of a story. And at some point, um, I talked to Jerry and I said that I had just seen Christian Marclay's The Clock. And I'm not sure if anybody's familiar with it, but it's 24 hours of black and white video montage using scenes from famous films, and it's all stitched together. And I was in the Museum of Modern Art in like my seventh hour of the film, and I had read, at that point, 30 or so books about Joan of Arc, and they were sort of like spinning in this great galaxy above me. And I had this sudden vision of how I could use, how it was possible not to be used by all those other retellings, but to use them the way Markley had and to allow sort of Shakespeare to drop in a line of dialogue or um, Brecht or anybody. And so biography just became sort of bigger and more exciting and um, than I ever imagined it would be. And you know, I just, I never had an experience like I did working on this book. Um, I know that I won't again. I don't think it's possible. I got up at five in the morning and I ran upstairs to my study as if I were falling into the arms of a lover. And at the end of the day, it was so hard to pull myself out of her thrall. It was just that rapturous, heightened experience, um, which, uh, and I did force myself today to go back to all of my emails, which I have saved, to the terrible event of turning in the epilogue, which required 55 emails and 25 drafts of the final chapter, most of which came with a subject line, this okay, comma, this is less fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and sometimes it was slightly less fucked up, but mostly from, from the middle of January until January 30th, 
I just kept sending one after another dreadful draft of the epilogue after having performed relatively in a normal way up until then, you know, sort of turning out chapters on time. And they, but this was really just evidence of the fact that I just couldn't let go. I just was not ready. <laughs> I was so not let ready, not let ready to go of this. <laughs> I was so unready. Um, and you know, long um, a really long time ago, when I was a half a life ago, when I was in my thirties, I had um, I was seeing a, an analyst who worked with people who were artists mostly creative people and she wanted she asked me a question about motivation creative motivation and I said oh fear <laughs> and she said and she looked at me sort of slightly sadly and said oh and I said well what else you know what what would push me to write and she sort of smiled and I said really I, I want to know and she said love and you know, I, re I feel that I learned that with Jerry and that, and I know actually that this time I was grateful in the moment and that there were days in which at the end of the day, I just put my head down on my desk and said, thank you, because I had gotten somewhere that I never expected to get as a writer or an artist or somebody collaborating. It was completely about love and yeah, the, I, I imagine it will end up being the best experience of my writing life, and you know that is totally fine. I feel like I just got the brass ring. Thank you. Thank you. No, I'm really super grateful. Yeah. I the hope. Was no safe. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Jerry and I inherited each other. We first met when we came together to work on my second Sinatra volume as Phyllis Gran, who edited the first volume and was its great champion, was in the process of retiring from Doubleday. This could have been a sticky situation. Phyllis was invested in the whole Sinatra project, which had been born at a dinner party at her home. But Jerry and I needed to get to work on volume two with no strings attached, with no confusing lines of stewardship or editorial direction. Writers are, as we know too well, solitary and insecure creatures. And it's easy to imagine that any writer would, secretly or not so secretly, take glee in being contended over. But that fantasy, if it ever was a fantasy of mine, was quickly dispelled by the grace and mutual respect of two great editors. Phyllis continued to read and comment on the chapters I was writing. Jerry and I rolled up our sleeves. One thing I learned immediately about Jerry Howard was his intense resistance to cliche and can't. He can smell a molecule of horse shit two blocks away. <laughs> And of course, one of the hoariest cliches in publishing is the sad song of the ideal of Max Perkins, the genteel and invisible and ultimately involved editor, 
giving way to editors who don't edit anymore. All they do is acquire and go to lunch and acquire some more. But I lucked into getting to work with the cliche buster supreme. Jerry was and is far too well known as a stylish and fiercely intelligent writer himself on a variety of subjects to be invisible. At the same time, his intense commitment to the books he edited prevented him from being anything like high-handed or disengaged. If he was working with you, he really was working with you, hands off when necessary, but with you, zoned in every inch of the way. Never shy about speaking up, but allergic to anything like injecting his ego into the proceedings. But never shy about speaking up. Always in the most respectful way, of course. No, Jim, the word ambivalent cannot refer to a thing or a situation, only to a person. Or can we try to avoid Lear references even when Sinatra becomes a raging old man? <laughs> and early email. It's Jerry talking. The manuscript is very clean, and I mostly am only asking at this point that you cut down the extensive quotes from, for instance, Doris Day by half through the use of ellipses and paraphrase. I do think the use of the excellent phrase, many chambered soul, should be limited to maybe twice in the book with plenty of space <laughs> in between. I wonder if school kids have to study that poem these days. I kind of think not. <laughs> Which poem was that again? I quickly discovered that Jerry's frame of reference was more than wide. It was cinemascopic, and that this felt especially brotherly. His cultural sensibilities brooked no evaluative distinction between the high and the low. He could access lesser Matthew Arnold and Jan and Dean's greatest hits. His obsession with the Rolling Stones, only a little greater than mine, became a touchstone between us, as did our mutual love of Miles, Train, and Monk. We soon found we shared the same fantasy slash regret that by being born just a couple of years too late, we had just missed catching Monk at the five spot in the summer of 57. And, yeah, and had we not been too young and dumb to think of it, we actually could have caught Coltrane at Birdland before he left this mortal coil in 1967. It would have been all too easy for us to be oil and water, Jesuitical meets Talmudical, Instead, we found we had more in common than not. We were both New York boys to our roots, his father an NYPD detective, mine a garmento. We loved much of the same music and literature, we laughed at many of the same things, and we loved the words we worked on to be gleaming and spare and right. It was a big book, and we produced much of the last couple of hundred pages to, under deadline pressure to get it out in time for Sinatra's centennial. I couldn't have made it what it was without him. I'm forever grateful to him for having upped my game. And so to my brother from another mother, as Q would say, congrats, Jerry. Well, congratulations, Jerry. This is a well-deserved honor to one of the great editors of American Publishing, and I said that without any hesitation. Um, having worked with many editors, this, Jerry was the finest editor I worked on. Um, interestingly enough, our mutual friend, Sir Gore Vidal, Saint Gore Vidal of Ravello, not quite um, M Mother Teresa, Blessed, blessed um, Gore Vidal. Of, we used to ha we had amazing conversations about Gore over many years. I worked on a biography of Gore with Jerry, and I st just the other day I looked at my manuscript. Whenever I got a book back from Jerry, it would be these little yellow stickers everywhere, and there would be hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them. And so it was like astonishing homework. I always told Jerry he would have been a great professor. I went into academic life hoping to meet people like Jerry Howard, and they weren't there. <laughs> <laughs> it's, not, it's been a hard time, it's been a hard life. Uh, Gore used to call me regularly. He liked the fact that Jerry was his editor and my editor. He'd always say on the phone calling from Ravello, and how is our friend, the, the uh, young man of letters, <laughs> Jerry Howard. Uh, and, and Gore did really love working with Jerry, as I did. Um, how I, 
I never told he never told you that he loved you? No. Oh yes. I want to, he said to me, he's got the cutest little butt. <laughs> I, to, I told Suzanne that. Gore used to always say that. He's got the cutest little butt. I thought he said that about Gary Piscajon. <laughs> no. Oh, he said that about all the time. <laughs> yeah. I certainly, um, I, I was thinking this uh, last night, how did I get, first get involved with Jerry? And it was when I had a miserable editor somewhere else and I remember I went to this editor with, I said, I, she said, oh, it was a new editor. And I, she said, so what are you working on now? I said, well, I'm just finishing a book uh, which is sort of based on the life of Robert Graves. She said, Robert Graves, that doesn't ring any bells. Oh. I said, Robert Graves doesn't ring any bells. So I called my agent <laughs> in desperation after that lunch. And I said, I'm, I, I, I can't believe this new editor of mine. Robert Graves doesn't ring any bells. I mean, I, very, it turns out there were very few gongs going off in that editor's mind. But, <laughs> right, it was all, all, all no, yes, no birds sang in that brain. <laughs> but um, I said to my agent at the time, Jerry Toma, isn't there an editor in New York that I could work with? She said, well, she said, the only editor who would ever be suitable for someone like you would be Jerry Howard, but we'd never get to him. He's so busy. Well, it was a couple of years later, I was at some party. I think it was a National Book Award ceremony. And suddenly at my elbow was Jerry Howard. And he said, Melville, Herman Melville, you should write a novel about Herman Melville. Um, come and write one for me. And so that started the whole thing, which was a long and happy marriage of editor and writer, writer and editor. I don't know which one was the writer, which one was the editor. But um, he became an extremely close friend, which he remains. I worshipped him. I loved working with him. And uh, he's one of the best things that ever happened to me and many writers in America. So congratulations to you. Without further ado, as the uh, chair of the Editorial Excellence Award Committee, it is my absolute pleasure to give this prize to Jerry Howard in recognition of his decades of service to biography and biographers. Thank you. First, the thank yous. Um, I'm exceedingly grateful, of course, the Biographers International Organization for this award, which uh, in career terms is uh, slightly posthumous. Um, <laughs> since I'm retired, I, I tried to get out, but you pulled me back in. Um, this would not have happened without the vigorous efforts of um, my pal, Debbie Applegate, who at this point seems to know more about the books I published than I remember. It has been such a privilege to work uh, over these decades with this brilliant writer. Um, thank you, Debbie. Uh, you're really too good at this to stop, so don't. Um, I, wanna th I wanna thank you so much to my other friends here who have shown up in person or on video for this highbrow, low wattage celebrity roast. Um, <laughs> Madison, uh, Jim, Catherine, Jay, what fine people you are, what, a, what fine work you do. Uh, my wife, Suzanne Williams, here tonight, means the world to me and makes everything, every single thing possible. There's a line that Earl Flynn, playing uh, George, General George Armstrong Custer delivers to his wife, and they died with their boots on, that I think about in respect to my marriage a lot. Uh, I can't deliver it as well as Earl Flynn. Walking through life with you, my dear, has been a very gracious thing. I could not say it better. Uh, I was very lucky over the course of my career to have had bosses who trained me well 
and who supported my enthusiasms, uh, mostly. Uh, they were John Thornton at New American Library, Catherine Court at Viking Penguin, Don Lamb and Edwin Barber at W.W. Norton, and first Steve Rubin, and then uh, Bill Thomas, who is also my good friend and was uh, still my good friend and was my valued colleague at Doubleday. I owe them a very big debt. Uh, <laughs> my editor for the Malcolm Cowley Project, uh, Scott Moyers of the Penguin Press, is here. You should all try to get Scott as your editor. <laughs> he is kind, encouraging, beautifully well-read, sharp, wise, and, very important, patient. I am writing for him. He is the voice in my head. I would like to thank the following people for having lived. <laughs> um, interesting and significant biography were the lives that they did live. Polly Adler, Diane Arbus, John Adonassoff, Lester Bangs, Henry Ward Beecher, James F. Burns, Julius Caesar, Bob Dylan, W.C. Fields, Iceberg Slim, Iggy Pop, Joan of Arc, Harold Lasky, Hedy Lamar, Mary McCarthy, Norman Mailer, Audie Murphy, Edward Mybridge, Jack Nicholson, Jerome Robbins, Frank Sinatra, Susan Sontag, Robert Stone, Gore Vidal, Tom Waits, Edwin O. Wilson, and Paul Wittgenstein. Let's throw in the bands, the Flaming Lips, the Grateful Dead, and Wilco for good measure. If you include all the memoirs I published, I've certainly led a rich, vicarious existence over the past four decades. I'm sure you won't mind uh, if I invoke the names of two biographer friends of mine, well known to you all, who were taken from us far too early, Patty Bosworth and Jim Atlas. I miss them like hell. And I know you all do as well. Hey, honey, can, could you hand me that book which I forgot to bring? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. That's a prop. Um, so in thinking about the writing and publishing of biographies these past weeks, I remembered something that had slipped my mind. The very first true adult book I read was a biography. Uh, we always had books around our apartment in Brooklyn when I was growing up, but there were library books. Uh, we owned about maybe 12 books of our own, um, mid-century middle-brow bestsellers like A.J. Cronin's The Citadel and Kenneth Roberts' The Northwest Passage, uh, a dictionary for Scrabble, that sort of thing, all in a small bookshelf in the corner. Um, but at about 11 years of age, I took down one of those books it was a red one without a dust jacket, and started browsing it because it had some really funny and unusual photos in it. That book was Robert Louis Taylor's W.C. Fields, His Follies and Fortunes. Then I started to read it, and although a great deal of it got by me or was puzzling, the words weren't too big, and I thought that this man, W.C. Fields, he was like really a nut. Um, uh, in, in time, I would see his movies and become a huge fan, which I am to this day, uh, just like my old man was. And that, uh, this is that very book, Doubleday, 1949. So when I was at Norton, I ended up publishing another biography of Fields, this one by an antic but very thorough Englishman, Simon Lubish. Uh, it was sobering to find out that many of the best stories in this book were simply untrue. <laughs> uh, why was that? Uh, well, it turns out that the biography was originally supposed to be written by the famous journalist and biographer Gene Fowler. Uh, he was great friends with Fields, and he'd simply taken down what Fields, who was a fabulous of the, of the highest order, uh, had told him, no doubt, over many, many drinks. But Fowler abandoned the project, and he gave all his notes to Taylor, uh, who simply repeated them in the spirit of it all being just too good to fact check. Uh, so no fields did not leave bank accounts strewn under strange assumed names like A. Pismo Clam and Sneed Herd in like one horse towns across America in his vaudeville years. And no, he did not spike the orange juice of child actor Baby Leroy with gin in, re 
in revenge for the kids stealing all his scenes. Uh, more's the pity, I say, as they say in The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance, print the legend. Um, so I was raised under a strict regime of Irish Catholic parenting. My mother had a large repertoire of techniques to keep her only son's head from swelling and him from, as the saying goes, getting above himself. Um, in that spirit of enforced modesty, I want to tell you about my most conspicuous failure as an editor of biographies. The story is, I think, instructive, and the whole business raises some core issues in respect to intended audiences and biographical style. So, as you heard from Jay, I have a serious Melville obs obsession. I've read all his books, stories, and poems, except for Clarel, his book-length poem about a trip to the Holy Land. I mean, you know. And, <laughs> and, and the truly weird Marty, which, I, which is just unreadable. Um, now, in the textbook department at Norton, there was this brilliant editor, John Benedict, who made the company just buckets of money from his editing of the Norton anthologies and the Norton critical editions and other books and literary studies. One of his authors was the great Melville scholar, Herschel Parker, who had put together the Norton critical Moby Dick. Uh, and Professor Parker was under contract to Norton for what was supposed to be, ha, a one volume biography of Melville. But then John Benedict died quite suddenly. So after a decent interval, I went to Don Lamb's office and volunteered myself to serve as the editor of that biography and I got the job. Now I really consecrated myself to this task. I, I drove down to Professor Parker's home in Del Delaware to meet with him and hear what he had to say about the project which was so clearly the culminating task of his entire scholarly life. He was very proud, a bit prickly, and quite competitive with other Melville scholars, and, and he was deeply worried that what he had unearthed not be somehow stolen by other biographers. Uh, well, okay, I'm a close reader of Pale Fire. I knew what this was about. Uh, now, the main practical problem facing us was that the one volume had grown into two, and the manuscript of volume one, which took Melville from his birth to the day of publication of Moby Dick was, holy cow, 1,400 pages without back matter. So the, so the first thing I had to do was have meetings with the design and production departments to estimate what was the largest page count that could accommodate the binding technology of the day. <laughs> with a page layout that would not cause blindness. <laughs> we came up with an upper limit of uh, 950 manuscript pages. I so informed Professor Parker of this, who seemed to understand what needed to be done and why. So I sat down to my task with lots of sharpened pencils. Now the fact is that Herschel Parker was really quite a good writer. Uh, many of his set pieces were first rate and he had a, f a feeling for Melville's difficult early family life, his vaunting ambition, his financial uh, problems. But he was also determined to put everything, everything that he had learned into his book and, and without end notes either. All of the sources would be cited in the text itself. So I did my best to cut the fat and not the narrative muscle and I was really careful about it, I think. But the same problems kept cropping up, and at a certain point I began to resort to the shorthand of acronyms. MTMA meant moving the Melvilles around, which <laughs> Professor Parker did a great deal with. WH question mark meant where's Herman? Uh, <laughs> as, as Melville himself would be offstage for pages of, at a time while, while a lot of other business was being transacted. Um, after one of the longest slogs of my editorial career, uh, although I, I really hasten to add that there was a great deal in volume one that I remember to this day and I was very glad to have learned and read, I packed off the edited manuscript to Herschel Parker and awaited uh, his response. Uh, my labors were not well received. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> he wrote a letter to Don Lamb telling him that he felt that I had treated his work with, quote, contempt, <laughs> and that he wanted to, wanted to buy back his contract, which he did. <clears throat> this was, as you can imagine, uh, pretty dismaying. Uh, in the event, the two volumes were published by the Johns Hopkins University Press, books that I own. As far as I can tell, they entered the world exactly as Herschel Parker wrote them without any help and or meddling from an editor. Uh, the book is unquestionably the standard biography of Melville and it will be referred to, if not read, for many decades to come. <laughs> I can feel a letter from Herschel Parker coming. Um, there are many other things to say about it, and certain critics took issue with it on the matter of length and whether that length was really necessary. I thought a lot, of, a lot over the years about this, as you can imagine, and how I might have handled matters differently. Uh, the first mistake was that I misread my man. I should never have allowed myself the indulgence of my mildly ironic uh, editorial acronyms. Professor Parker's sense of humor stopped at the border of his scholarly work. And I should have realized that Herschel Parker was actually writing his biography for two audiences, himself and the small company of Melville scholars who could appreciate and, and perhaps be jealous of the labors behind all the Melville facts that he'd unearthed. Uh, as they famously say on Seinfeld, not that there's anything wrong with that. But he had no interest in the needs of that mythical creature, the general reader, that I as a trade editor had always had in mind. Uh, you know, I might have figured this out or given an end to it at the time, except for two considerations. I really wanted to work on the book, and Herschel Parker could write very, very well when he wasn't peacocking his scholarship. I savored, for instance, his description of Herman Melville disembarking from an American man of war after his uh, three years at sea, striding across the Boston docks with the sailor's gait, manly, handsome, a nautical hottie, ready to woo his wife-to-be Elizabeth Shaw and to become the literary sex symbol that Taipei uh, would make him. But if I'd had the benefit of hindsight back then, I would have known that we were always going to be at cross purposes, and I really wasn't the editor that Herschel Parker wanted. I would have gone to Don Lamb and kicked the whole issue upstairs. Uh, the only way Norton or anyone else was going to publish this biography was exactly as Herschel Parker had written it in length and in approach. If the House wanted to go ahead with the book on that basis, that would be fine, and someone else in the company uh, could have seen it in the print. I still think my edits of the manuscript would have improved volume one by making it a more narratively efficient reading experience and perhaps drawing in a somewhat different class of reader outside of the academy. But the book was a runner up for the Pulitzer Prize, so what do I know? Um, I'm not quite sure what the moral of this story is, <laughs> aside from my own fallibility. I, 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 deeply, I deeply respect academics, but as an editor, I was never a creature of the academy. <laughs> this, this was a clash, I suppose, of both temperaments and expectations, which, which I, I regret. Um, but at least I know almost to the dollar how much Herman Melville died in debt to Harper Brothers, and why the publishing contracts of that time <coughs> made, it, made that almost inevitable. So the thing about editing biographies, I, I, and about this one, that, uh, was that I learned so much about other people, about Melville's life, and with all this, about so many other lives. And that was the real pleasure of the enterprise. Um, thanks, thanks again for this award. Um, it's a, just an unexpected and such a <laughs> lovely thing to receive. <laughs>